I don't know, Ralph, are we going to commiserate about this? Uh, why? Why <laughs> is the question? <laughs> why her again? Why was she not punished for all of the corruption? And how are Europeans stuck with her? Well, I think what we see in slightly different tracks, we see a parallel development in the United States and in Europe. But right? exactly as you pointed out, so you have Ursula von der Leyen, who apart from the fact that she's more or less on the brink of being a convicted criminal, which should worry everyone, uh, as is, by the way, the head of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde. So you could, if you want to be facetious, you could say pretty much Europe is now run by, by criminals, which I guess some of us always had an inkling that they're run by corrupt people, but now it's actual criminals. So that's one point. But the second point is, which I think is almost the more important one, is the, the people in Europe, the people in the United States, we have been gaslit, we have been betrayed by the media to the extent in quote unquote free democracies is unimaginable. Right? So you had two cases. One was Ursula von der Leyen, who supposedly, and I cannot stress this enough, is the candidate of the conservative European People's Party. But if you look how she actually got to the second term, it was with the support of the Greens, because she really was, you know, Europe black is kind of the color of the conservative parties. So she was black on the outside and green on the inside. Now, I don't know what kind of fruit that would be, but pretty much that is her political agenda. If you look at her career, right, she always endorsed and promoted green policies. There were German journalists who said, well, she was still um, active in national politics in Germany. They said they never understood why she's for the CDU, the Conservative Party in Germany, since her policies are all green policies. But the media carried the lie along, right? They said, oh, this is a conservative candidate. This is you know, a centrist, center-right candidate. It's not. It's a left slash far left candidate that now got a second term. And everything you described from Ukraine policy, from COVID, but of course also insanities like the Green Deal, deindustrialization. These are all things that she endorses. She opened a conference on degrowth just a couple of months back that was promoting basically the deindustrialization of Europe. And the same thing, I would argue, you saw in the United States recently with the cognitive decline of Joe Biden, where we have been told for three years, no, no, he's fine. He's, you know, the sharpest tool in the shed. He's so smart. He's, how did Joe Scarborough say? He's the best Joe Biden there ever was. The amount of lies that the mainstream and legacy media has served the people on both sides of the Atlantic, I think is astounding. And this is why I'm first of all grateful for your shout out to my new small podcast, but I have to return the favor. This is why I think redacted is so important because they lie to us and they will do exactly the same thing now that von der Leyen is back in office in Europe and that now Kamala Harris is going to run for president in the United States. Right. So can you explain once again, because European politics is a little confusing, how the people of Europe have never voted in Ursula von der Leyen. It's a representative government that votes for her in the same way now that the Democrats never voted for Kamala Harris, but will be forced to support her. I see those parallels as quite shocking yes. now. No, you, you, you're absolutely right. The degree to which the, the those who are in power are no longer accountable to the people is astounding. Like for a while they did it in secrecy, right? This was kind of the outsourcing uh, of all kind of obligations to unnamed bureaucracies and kind of taking them away from democratic accountability. But you're right, now it's happening the same where in the way in which offices are staffed and with offices aligned. You're absolutely right. Nobody really wants her in office. Like just as you said, it's the case in the United States, right? The, 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 People feel increasingly that they really no longer have a say in who governs them. And that is correct, right? We talked about this the last time I was on the show. Now you had have partially these weird electoral systems that no longer reflect the will of the people. Now you have the bureaucracies that no longer reflect the will of the people. And I truly believe maybe it takes five years, maybe it takes five months, but this is how you get into pre-revolutionary territory. Because at some people, at some point, if people no longer feel the ability to express the satisfaction or dissatisfaction at the voting booth, or as, as Joe Biden would say, at the battle box. Well, then all you can do ultimately is, of course, a, a form of uprising. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, Mad Max on the, on the Champs-Élysées or something. But of course, you move closer and closer in this direction because you have people in power that pursue policies that people don't want. Yet the media tells them, oh, no, 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 you're mistaken. Don't trust. This, this is basically what they tell us. They say, don't trust your own eyes. And I found this in Europe worrisome, but I think in the United States, we saw it being driven into hyper gear the last couple of months. I mean, if you just as a quick last point, I mean, if you look at all the videos and we talked about this, right, where they claimed, oh, it's cheap fakes, it's out of context, don't take it seriously. 
They then three weeks later use the very same videos to say, look at those videos. He has to go. They like the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN. Yeah. They all lied to us. And there is no other way to put this. They lied. By the way, of course, also Kamala Harris lied to us because she must have known what was going on with Joe Biden. And she pretended that he's fine. And the same is true in Europe, right? When they say, oh, no, don't worry, Miss von der Leyen is a conservative, a center-right candidate. No, she isn't. And this is the worst. And there is there are kind of three types of parties, I believe, in the United States, but even more so in Europe. There is the far left, and then there is the center left. And then there is the right. And the right is what the media constantly depicts and smears as the far right, but they are not. And this is, I think, the same in the United States with Donald Trump. He is not far right. Le Pen is not far right. These people are, you know, almost ridiculously boring center right politician. It just seems as far right because the left has moved so far to the left. These are common sense people. And I think this must be emphasized again and again and again and again, because otherwise we're going to end up with more and more and more further to the left governments. And unfortunately, their agendas are not good for the people. I don't know how else to describe it. Right. And you know that until recently we lived in Portugal and I was increasingly afraid to criticize the European government because it became oh, yes. increasingly unsafe to do so in in Germany, in the UK, which I know is not part of the EU. But it, it's these are far left policies that are terrifying. Now, in Ursula von der Leyen's acceptance speech, she outright said that she would increase military spending. So what the people of Europe get is an unelected leader that they did not vote for, who has tanked their economy, made their living expenses astronomically higher in order to support war in Ukraine, first and foremost. But I've, I believe any war would satisfy her appetite. And so they will get more of this. I don't understand how they're not more upset about it because it will only get worse. So why is she so tone deaf about Europeans' appetite for war? And what can any European do about it, like you said, besides a revolution? Well, I think there's an explanation for this. I know we kind of dive now a little bit into, into the psychology of politicians, and that's always a tricky issue. So I try to be as respectful about this as I can. But I think there's a phenomenon, and for me, that's the true phenom phenomenon that distinguishes the right from the left, is the left has this kind of absurd in inverse narcissism where, where they kind of show their own virtue, how great they are by supporting anybody and any cause that is not connected to their own people, their own heritage, their own country, exactly as you said. Right? I think we see this when you take the war policy. Right? It is very absurd that the same politicians who cannot protect Europe's borders, the same politicians who say we can't do anything about migration, the same politicians that say that sovereignty is a far-right concept, apply all these concepts that they hate when they're applied to the Europeans, they hate or kind of defend them when they apply to Ukraine. Right? So when the Germans say protect our borders, limit migration, Germany for the Germans, if you excuse that expression, I'm using it provocatively, then that's a far right quasi Nazi fascist thing. But if you say the same thing in the case of Ukraine, right, you know, Ukraine for the Ukrainians, protect Ukrainian sovereignty, protect Ukrainian borders, then it says, of course, that's a sensible position. And we have to defend this as much as we can in every way possible. And the reason for this, I think, is we see this in all other areas as well. I think the same is, by the way, true with environmentalism. I think that there is this concept that the Europeans have, to, and the Americans, I think the American left makes the same case. We have to sacrifice ourselves, our own civilization, for somebody else, right? We have to sacrifice ourselves on the altar of immigration, on the altar of endless wars, on the altar of, you know, you name it, of environmentalism, on the altar of transgenderism, because this is how we atone for the sins of the past. This is how we atone for the sins of Western civilization. And most people don't want this because they like Western civilization, right? They like their own heritage, they like their own traditions. But even saying what I just said would make you far right or neo-Nazi or fascist in 90% of the mainstream media and the United States and, and Europe, right? And that's the biggest problem. When you say common sensical things these days, you are still depicted and painted as a far right individual. So we have to recover, we have to regain the center ground, kind of saying, no, this is not far right. This is not a radical position. This is a common sense position. 
you know, de defending your heritage, your civilization, your borders, wanting to control migration, want to wanting an economy that works for the people and not for somebody else, not for a minority, some interests, you know, offshoring manufacturing abroad. Like these are common sense politics that everybody would agree with, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And now all of a sudden, all of this is quasi Hitler. It's very absurd. So I think it's very important, as George Orwell would say, to state the obvious again and again and again and again, because what you said is so important. You're terrified increasingly these days of stating the obvious. It's, it's not that yeah. you say, oh, you know, I have such radical views, I cannot say them in public. It's saying the obvious. And this is what, what's yes. worse. I mean, it reminds me, I don't want to mix up my American pro president. So I think it was Jefferson. So I'm just, I, I, I plead that I'm an ignorant uh, foreigner here. But it's a famous saying, right? A government that fears its people is a democracy and the people that fear their government is, is a tyranny. And I think on a scale, right, we're kind of moving closer to the latter and away from the former. And that is a problem. Yes, it is a problem. Well, uh, I, I appreciate your analysis very much because at least we're on the level, even if we <laughs> are being fed the same stuff. Something that I was thinking about over the weekend as this Kamala Harris news broke is, OK, I'm going to have to exercise my ability to not buy into the crap about like, oh, yay, it's a woman. These leaders are women. And I recall sometime a decade ago, a 60 Minutes piece that was praising Christine Lagarde because she was a woman. Look at her. She's a leader. She is an economist. And oh, she's a woman. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? And now they're going to warm up that crap around Kamala Harris. And it will be a distraction from the fact that these people fund women wars that they lead innocent civilians to their death and i cannot abide it and so what can you tell me as i warm up my opposition to this crap gender argument well you no know, as, as, as a white middle-aged male who am i to tell you so <laughs> <That's> right <laughs> I, I guess what i'm asking you is that you've been fed this about these people like oh but christine lagarde but she's a woman that's why you know we can't go after her because she's a woman ursula yeah. von der leyen yes but she's a strong woman right so i guess what i uh, what i'm saying is uh it, you know how have you seen that play out in europe do you think europeans think are now a, tired of this we're not going to have yes. this anymore because christine lagarde used our money or not christine lagarde i'm sorry ursula von der leyen used our money for back channel pfizer deals well, it's, it's true for both of them, right? Again, if, I think you, you, you're you too generous here uh, also to Christine Lagarde. For example, the ECB did the same thing. They all of a sudden started making claims that it's within the mandate of the European Central Bank to support green policies, which has nothing to do with ECB policies. I would make the one argument, which is that contrary to what the left-leaning media tells you, the Western man or the Western mind is not very sexist. And I think we have the best proof for this. Look at Giorgio Meloni, whatever you think of her policies in Italy. Look at Le Pen in, in France. People have a problem voting for a woman if they then feel that the position of the woman in question aligns with their own position. So if, if, if you're a patriot, a nationalist, as I, as I consider myself, and the candidate of mm -hmm. the nationalist patriot party is a woman, I vote for it just the same as I would if it's a man. I think this is, again, it's an obsession of the left. It's, it, this is the thing. The left always projects their own obsession, racism, sexism, all they project it on others. Most on the right don't care. They, li you know, they like Le Pen, they like Margaret Thatcher, they admired uh, Queen Elizabeth II. They had absolutely no problem with women. They have a problem with women who stand against what they believe in, like von der Leyen, like Kamala Harris, like uh, uh, Christine Lagarde. But that's actually a, an objection based on their positions, not an objection based on their gender. It's a, this is, again, I'm glad you brought this up, because this is what the left always does. They force us to play on their terms, right? And then all of a sudden, we and this, I'm glad we have this conversation, but then all of a sudden we need to have a conversation about, well, but what about the gender? Isn't that an issue? Shouldn't we talk about this? And yes, we should. And we should talk about it in a way to say it doesn't matter. And for most people on the right, it does matter. Fine. Is there a handful of people out there who might say, I will never vote for a woman? Probably. I don't know. But I don't think that this would be a vote that really that really matters. What really matters, I think, is and this is, again, the, the kind of where we are fed this kind of miss and this whatever information you want to call it to use a term that's popular on the left. 
I mean, look at the biography of people that run for office these days. Now, say whatever you want about Donald Trump. I have my issues with the man, but generally I support him for a variety of reasons. But this is a man right, who built up a business, uh, both in real estate and then later on in, uh, you know, as, as, as a show businessman, who more or less was successful in everything he undertook, including surviving an assassination attempt and becoming the American president. Yet somehow we are told that this guy cannot be led anywhere near to power, but lifelong bureaucrats who never did anything but, you know, run through the hierarchy of a party, who never created a dime of wealth in their entire life, who never did anything outside either the state or the party bureaucracy, like van der Leyen, like Kamala Harris, they are the ones you want to have in charge. And I find this so absurd. It's a form of decadence that has infected us in the West, right? What kind of we, we, we have our priorities mixed so much upside down that we honestly believe that somebody who never put in an earnest day of work in their entire life is better suited for high office than somebody who actually demonstrated throughout his career that he did something. Again, I said, I have my issues with Donald Trump. There, there are things that I'm mm -hmm. not particularly happy with, but overall, this is an impressive man. And he showed that he is. I really want to make this point again um, in, in, the, in the five, 10 minutes and, and the days after his assassination attempt. This was a man I have, and I, I'm surprised that what this was the case. I didn't expect it, but that showed character, right? That showed a certain degree of heroism, I would almost say, that we have not seen, you know, since the sinking of the Titanic. And, you know, what, what kind of people really put and their own selfish behavior behind a, a greater cause. So, so I hope that the Americans do see this because I think he would be a better president and Europe for the moment is lost. So it's gonna be up to you guys to, you know, to, to drag yourself and then us with you out of out of the mud. So November is going to okay. be a <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you, I don't know if you know the Churchill quote that Americans will always do the right thing, but only when they've exhausted all other options. I'm paraphrasing. And I think that is correct. Uh, yes. Okay. So I make no promises, but I appreciate that. And I think, you know, I gave you a landmine to step in about gender and you handled it beautifully. So, uh, I, I appreciate your response very much. So we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Ralph, for your time. Again, check out his new show, Hammer Time on YouTube, and you can also follow him on Twitter. Thanks, Natalie. That's going to do it today for us on Redacted. But you know that we are in a crazy news cycle, so you got to stick with us. You can't go anywhere. We will be here tomorrow, same time. It's 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, hey, check out the newsletter because the newsletter is a good Cliff's Notes for what we're going to talk about in the show. It's totally free, and we try to link you to all original sources so that you have a place to read and study and think for yourself. Uh, it's also maybe a little fun. We got a lot of tidbits in there. It's at redacted.inc. You just go there, put in your email address and authenticate the email when you get it. And it's totally free. Like I said, there's no upsart, upcharge or anything like that. So please do subscribe. It's how we get in touch with you outside of the normal platforms that we are beholden to. So again, it's redacted.inc. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.